Just a quick warning. There is explicit language in this episode. So if you have kids around or you just don't want to hear that kind of colorful language, you might want to sit this one out. Okay, on to the show. First, you hear the car. Then you see it in all its peptobismal pink glory. A bright pink Cadillac stretched into a limousine. It's glorious, it really is. Times like this, staggering out of a bar, nice buzz, happy to be in Mexico again, looking forward to some street meat, it's a powerful kick in the nuts to find a stupefyingly embarrassing pink limousine waiting for you. Back in 2012, the late great celebrity chef and food guru Anthony Bourdain visited Tijuana for his No Reservations Travel Channel show. And the limo that showed up to take Bourdain around, that was courtesy of Antonio Ley, a well-known fixer in Tijuana. Most people who know him call him Tony T. Who knows what wacky stunts could be planned for me next? I don't know! You're don't in know. Tijuana. And I'm in Tijuana. That's scary. Tony was tapped to take Bourdain to foodie hotspots around Tijuana because he's the guy who knows a guy. He's one of the unofficial ambassadors of the city and just a fun person to be around. For years, Tony was a well-known party promoter here. For a little over a decade, from 2007 to 2018, Tijuana was Tony's oyster. He's someone who could always find pearls everywhere inside the city, no matter how dark things seem to get. It's like the city just sort of opens up for him. But if you keep watching that episode with Tony and Anthony Bourdain, you'll see that the flashy pink limo, it actually breaks down, right in the middle of the street. I feel like this whole scene is sort of a perfect metaphor for what Tony T is going through right now. Because these days, Tony is feeling like Tijuana is sort of broken. A river of shit everywhere that dumps into San Diego. I can smell it from here. Full of pollution everywhere and nobody does a fucking thing about it. This is migrant and refugee and deportee Camps leaving in squalor, visibly, visibly, next to the neighborhood full of drugs and prostitution. So that's our reality. That's what I cross every day and see. And, you know, it's not like, I don't know, man. Maybe I'll give up and go live in Chula Vista and be in this lake and go to Walmart and whatever, right, Alan? Skyrocketing murder rates and other big issues have Tony just totally grappling with his relationship with the city. So in the metaphor, Tijuana is the pink Cadillac. It's flashy and looks like a lot of fun. But if you take a closer look and open the hood, like Anthony Bourdain and Tony did. It only gets worse when the doesn't even start. Everybody's laughing at us. Things can look pretty messy. causing a ruckus on the street. The cops are behind us. They're fishing the engine. Are we arrested yet? And right now, it's that messy part that Tony T can't unsee or ignore the way he always used to when he was younger. From KPBS and PRX, this is Port of Entry, where we tell cross-border stories that connect us. I'm Alan Lilienthal. Today, we continue our series on cross-border love stories with a tale of two cities, San Diego and Tijuana, and a common existential crisis triggered by living at the border. So we wanted to find out why exactly a former Tijuana booster could take such a sharp turn into becoming a Tijuana critic. 
We wanted to see what Tony sees every day, to feel what he feels so we could better understand his love-hate relationship with the city. So our sound designer, Emily Jankowski, my producer, Kinsey Moreland, and I, we met up with Tony one morning at his apartment. Hi, Kinsey. Hi, I'm going to hug you. I haven't seen you. <laughs> a long you? time. This was in the fall of 2019, by the way, hence the hug. It was months before the pandemic was a thing here at the border. And we met up in Tijuana at his place, which is modern and pretty fancy. So there's the pad. Nice. This is the nicest place I've ever lived in. Super nice. But it's TJ, so it's not perfect. The apartment is in a nice neighborhood in the hills of Tijuana, so his views were impressive. And you have a view of the giant Mexican flag over there. Yeah, we can, yeah, well, let's go to my terrace. So from my balcony, we could see downtown Tijuana beautifully. It's most iconic buildings like the fake arc, like the St. Louis one, the 10 story brothel called Hong Kong, that red one right there. And then there's uh, the High Lai building there. And then there's a big new apartment building. Further in the horizon is downtown San Diego, the Coronado Bridge. About two years ago, Tony and his wife had a baby girl. Her name is Frida. So full name, Frida Lay. So she's like a potato chip. <laughs> Famed uh, nightlife promoter Tony T from Tijuana now lives a life of a uh, daddy with toys and goes to sleep at 10.30 and walks his dog at 7 a.m. every day. Tijuana has been good to Tony. He's always loved the city, and the city has loved him back. But his relationship with Tijuana has gotten pretty rocky in recent years. The city has, for decades, struggled with ebbs and flows of drug-fueled violence as cartels battle for control. But this latest surge is something else. The murder rates in 2018, 2019, and 2020 are setting records. And Tony... He just can't brush it off the way he used to when he was younger. So let's just take a quick step back. And take a look at where Tony's love story with Tijuana began. Tony's parents are from Tijuana, but moved to San Diego to raise their family. His extended family lived in the city, though. So Tony grew up crisscrossing the border a lot. I say by 15 years old, I was going to Tijuana by myself, rollerblading to like, because I lived in Chula Vista, so I'd rollerblade to the nearest trolley station, which was always E Street. Graffiti was big then, so we had like big markers on us with our big Jenko pants and our rollerblades. <laughs> and we'd tag up like downtown San Diego, get on the trolley and, you know, go to TJ and get into trouble down there. That's when I really started liking Tijuana. And why? Because of the free rooms that were allotted to us that weren't in the US, like driving a car when you're 14 years old, like buying cigarettes, like getting into trouble. We liked music. We liked a lot of, it was the 90s. We liked the rock and Espanol thing. So really every weekend, I just finished the school, crossed the border, and there was always gonna be a show, you know? There was gonna be a rock show that night, whether it be local or some Spanish or some Argentinian dudes or Mexicans, like performing national artists, Café Tacuba, Caifanes, you've probably heard some of them. So those were my fondest, like, pre-15-year-old memories. I loved it. I think it's a rite of passage for upper-middle-class kids in Tijuana to start going clubbing when they're like 16 and 17 years old, you know? I went to a private high school in San Diego, a Catholic one, and we'd take girls to the nightclubs and we were 17 or whatever, and they would, <laughs> we would be seated with like bottle service like under a cascade and like a waterfall at the Baby Rock Club and the girls would go, no wonder you guys never go to the kegger parties in San Diego. We were like, well done. So Tijuana was paradise. <laughs> we got baby toys. We got your uh, Caps Little League Award. Back in Tony's Tijuana apartment, 
a trophy from his days in Little League in San Diego, sat on his kitchen counter. That was when, in the 90s, I was at a baseball team, and my dad's law firm was the sponsor of the fucking team. Okay? That's awesome! <laughs> on a faded picture glued to the trophy, a tiny Tony T smiled from underneath a Padres hat. It's a relic of his own fairly well-off childhood spent on the other side of the border with his lawyer father and his stay-at-home mom. Tony's life has always straddled the border. And on that day back in November of 2019, he showed us exactly how his life stretches across the two countries by taking us along with him on his daily cross-border commute, which was wild. Well, from my house to uh, Chula Vista, it takes about two hours usually. And it's not because the border is bad. It's because it's a long way and I take public transportation. But I prefer this way. I haven't crossed in a car in a long time. Why? Why do you not take a car? Because I don't like driving there. Let's get at it. It's a lot of walking over here. And we're going to look all funny on the fucking bus. Tony grabbed his keys and we headed downstairs to begin his gnarly cross-border commute. First, we headed east toward a dead-end street. Then we followed Tony as he stepped off the asphalt onto a steep vacant lot filled with broken bottles and all kinds of trash. Old tires, piles of cigarette butts, a dirty old blanket, and other things are scattered across the hill. It looks like someone might be using this patch of dirt as a home. So this gets to Tijuana really quick. Uh, what do you mean by that? Just grab it. It's, we're walking down an embankment that's got a little passageway. It's like hiking. It's what like you guys do in like Coles Mountain. This is what we do here urbanly. It's, uh, it wasn't finished, the road, so it leads to a bigger road from my kind of dead-end street. You're going to have to watch out here. And I never wear shoes like that in Tijuana anymore, Kinsey. <laughs> I wear work shoes always. You need a hand, let me know. Uh, Okay. And it's a big mess and it's pollution. There's a homeless guy that lives over there. And uh, you know, it's dirty. It, in the daytime, a lot of workers come by because a lot of people are building stuff in this neighborhood or housekeepers straight up. But at night, it's all tweakers. It's all tweakers, it's dark, and they come to try to get shit to smell. So you're gonna go over here like this. I got it. Go slowly here like this. How TJ did it get? Real quick, huh? <laughs> We made it down the hill and eventually hit a sidewalk alongside one of Tijuana's main roads. This street has become something like death row. It's lined with funeral homes and crematorios. The city's morgue is here too. And for a city that had record-breaking murder rates in 2018 and 2019, that means this street stays busy. We walked by several floral arrangements and families getting out of black cars to attend funerals for their loved ones. My neighborhood is one of the most uppity neighborhoods in town. One of the older ones, upscale. And uh, they want all this out of here. They don't want the morgue here because it's overflowing with bodies. It doesn't have the capacity to, to fit 10 murders a night plus normal people that die every day. And, uh, and so they've organized some of the neighbors and uh, through associations and non-government organizations have uh, solicited and even protested on the street to like remove these. Some of them are private businesses, like the funeral partners, but they're burning bodies and the smell, the cremation is everywhere. And then in the summer when it's hot, the morgue smells of death straight up. You know, you walk like in TJ sometimes and it smells like the gutter. But uh, this is different. It smells of death. This reality right here, all the murders and death, it's a big part of what's eating away at Tony. He's finding it hard to be an ambassador for the city because he keeps coming face to face with the consequences of the city's violence. So I was walking down here on Friday and on my journey to San Diego, I encountered two deaths. Uh, one of them was a police officer who was ran over. One of the ass, yeah. he was ran over right here. He was walking, he was a police officer, didn't have a car, I guess. He was taking the bus, he was older. He was ran over 
right here on Brazil Street and Fundadores. And then of course on my bus ride, I pa we pass by Zona Norte and there's like always a body almost there in the morning. There's a, yeah, yeah, there's gonna be a lot of them. We'll get back to our cross-border journey soon. But first, a little more about how Tony went from a teenager just having fun in Tijuana to someone whose name became somewhat synonymous with a city. So after high school, Tony moved to Monterrey in Mexico to follow in his dad's footsteps and study law. But he quickly realized that he wanted to blaze his own trail. And he knew exactly where he wanted to do it. I started throwing nightclub stuff in Tijuana. I learned how to throw rave parties. I met these guys from Juarez and from Monterrey that were like, they became some of the biggest promoters in Mexico later on, but they kind of like godfathered me and helped me do parties in Tijuana. Getting people to pay to go out in Tijuana came with an extra challenge because it's not like the violence the city is seeing now is something totally new. It was happening back then, too. In the 90s, uh, in probably in the first couple years of the 2000s, some of those upper middle class neighborhoods in Tijuana were some of the worst hit with the violence because, you know, the cartel capos, the, the Felix Arellano cartel, made their presence very known in the three or four neighborhoods that I would hang out in Tijuana. I'm seeing kids like young adults, 17 to 20 year olds, that would go missing or they ended up dead, shot. So people that I knew were killed. These were dark times uh, in Tijuana while we were out there because we'd hear a lot of stories about people getting shot and stuff like that. And we, these kids weren't from like the hood. These were private school kids. A lot of them were like dual citizenship guys like me, bilingual. Some of them got involved into the drug trade, but some were just bystanders and innocent people that got, you know, messed with or in a crossfire or whatever. And Tijuana was beginning to show that it could be one of these murder capitals of the world. But back then, Tony and other party kids like him, even though the violence sometimes touched people they knew, it still felt like something they could mostly ignore. The fear actually made the parties Tony was throwing feel slightly dangerous and exciting. And those lucky enough to know where and when the parties were happening, whether it was at a mansion outside of Rosarito or a burned out theater in downtown Tijuana, they were even more thrilled to go. Tony and the people going to his parties, it's like they felt immune. So Tony T wasn't just a promoter who brought big concerts to Tijuana and threw some crazy parties. He also used to be known for this other thing. For a few years, Tony was the official voice of the Zonkeys, Tijuana's basketball team. He's actually one of the founders who got the team up and running back in 2010. Visita nuestra página, www.tijuanasonkeys.com. Tijuana Sonkeys. So yeah, for a while there, Tony became a pretty high-profile public figure in Tijuana. And that's how he became the dude who got asked to take Anthony Bourdain around. And look, that episode, it's hard to overstate its importance and the impact it had on Tijuana back in 2012. And really, to this day... The city was experiencing a lull in drug-fueled violence at the time and was already on its way to becoming a foodie hotspot. But that episode blasted it into the mainstream zeitgeist. Read the headlines. The New York Times even putting Tijuana as a top destination in 2017. What's happening here is a culinary renaissance. People from San Diego, LA, and really everywhere were coming to Tijuana to taste the food that everyone was raving about. Guys like Tony and other fixers became the way a lot of tourists chose to navigate the city. Like if you were going to TJ, you needed your fixer, your personal tour guide. Someone like Tony, 
who knew the ins and outs of what most outsiders perceived as a dangerous and mysterious city. And Tony was super happy to do it. Until eventually, he just wasn't. Let's make this green light, huh? Shoot, don't run us over, don't run us over. Watch out. We're getting run over while you record your podcast. Anything for the podcast, Kinsey, I love that. <laughs> Back on our border trek, we continued past death row and headed toward a bus stop. We're passing by Tijuana's beautiful post office in downtown. Uh, just like the one in Mexico City, if you've ever been to the one in Mexico City, which is actually called Palacio Recorreos. It actually is really beautiful. It's in the Coco movie. But this one is all run down, graffitied, dirty. And uh, yeah, that's the post office here. How does that make you feel? How does this make me feel? How this is trash feel? everywhere. Everywhere we go is trash. Tijuana is a place of a lot of crisis. Eco crisis and violence crisis and migrant crises and addiction crises. And it makes me feel a bunch of shit every day when I cross and I see this. And it's hard not to juxtapose things when I work over there and live over here and I have the whole time. It's hard not to juxtapose it. It's hard not to compare. San Diego isn't the perfect clean city on the hill, but it's mi miles away from, uh, from Tijuana. And uh, it's hard. The bus is coming. We're going to walk this way. Why do you live in Tijuana then if you come across all these things that kind of make you feel... I ask uh, myself sometimes that too, Alan. Especially now more than I'm 39 and I'm a father. Uh, at the end of the day, I like Tijuana. Tengo nexos. Mi familia is from Tijuana. There's a huge class divide in Tijuana. And really in most of Mexico. Money buys you a different version of Tijuana. A much safer, at times maybe even lavish version of the city. Tony's somewhat privileged upbringing sheltered his view of the city for a long time. And yeah, you see a lot of things when you walk in TJ. A lot of people just drive in TJ, they don't pay attention to what's going on in their surroundings. I was totally, as a child, protected from seeing all the things that you're not supposed to see in Tijuana. And I thought Tijuana was just like, oh, the golf course, right? And, uh, and my friend Rick and those families, and no! Those were the people that knew my parents, and uh, let me see if that's our bus. But uh, sometimes I question it. The economic factor is one of them for sure. No, that's not it. Linea, linea, linea. No, that's gonna be the next one. Actually, the car's moving. Let's walk this way. Those are tacos chewy, those are great. They're smoky as hell, look at that. Those are great tacos. Tripa and asada. Hey! Centro Linea, this guy. That's ours. And now we're the assholes with a recording system and public transportation in Tijuana. You're welcome. <laughs> We gotta take a quick break. When we come back, we hop back on the bus with Tony. And he tells us more about how these days, he's finding himself using his promoter voice to get people to pay attention to Tijuana's problems rather than its parties. So we were on a city bus going from downtown Tijuana to Pedro West. That's the newest pedestrian crossing at the San Isidro port of entry. And Tony started to take us deeper inside his current existential conundrum. Are you still as enthusiastic about Tijuana? I, I want to be. I want to be. I live here. I want the city. It's a city, you know, we've got such a perfect neighbor with such a pretty house. And our house will never be that pretty. but. 
you can sweep the sidewalk in front of the house, right? Rather than sweep the sidewalk, though, a lot of proud Tijuanenses instead tend to sweep the city's problems under the rug. But Tony, he started using Facebook as a platform to put the problems on blast. And instead of posting about cool parties or great food in Tijuana like he used to, these days he's mostly posting about the killings and the chaos. And some of his friends, they're not his friends anymore because of it. Now that I criticize local government about violence and insecurity and trash and everything that's criticizable here to make it like the standard of living be better for everybody and not those people that I knew and grew up with, where the privileged few of this town, uh, well, they didn't like me so much anymore, those people. And I'm not trying to tell people, hey, don't go eat in Tijuana anymore, or don't drink craft beer in Tijuana. What I'm trying to say is, look what's happening in the city we live that had calmed down. Remember cuando se calmó? Ah, ya está bien todo. It calmed down. 2010, 2011, it chilled out. Ya se calmó. Oh, fast forward six, seven years. The worst numbers in the history of the city. Just so you know, before 2016, the most violent year in Tijuana was 800 murders. 2008. It tripled that last year, brother. There was more than 2,400 murders. What happened? What happened to the city we love and take care of so much? Or is it only for the people that could buy a Caesar salad and a craft beer? Is that what we're really only worried for collectively as a city? We're not worried about the people getting smoked every day? We're gonna brush them under the rug? Shit, I am human, I have a heart. I don't like seeing that. And I don't like seeing rich Tijuanenses Sons of privileged people going, they're just killing junkies anyway, bro. Oh, fuck you, man. Fuck you, dude. Like, I don't like it, especially when they say it, because they've gotten so much from the city. And they're probably saying it from their apartment in North Park, you know what I mean? So fuck them two times. The bus drove over a hill and the border crossing popped into view. Check the border. No line, no line, look at that. No line on the bridge. Then the bus drove across a bridge that stretches over the notorious Tijuana River, which is really more of a polluted cement canal filled with makeshift homes for the city's most destitute. And Tony, he got triggered because right here in this place, the difference between the two sides of the border just could not be any starker. We're seeing what I call a microcosm of all the problems in Tijuana, which is the river, the Tijuana River, uh, and the canal, the channel that was built here. It separates uh, Zona Norte, a place of drugs and prostitution, from the outlet center. The H&M is right there visible, a place of uh, crazy capitalism. And I get to see what both cities have to offer every day when I cross the border. This place, if you've read, and if, you know, this is a place of deportees, this is a place of drug use, this is where people land when times are tough. They live down there under those, and they're living on the bridge on top of there. You can see them there. You see that overpass, and you see the homeless people living on that bridge up there. So this is a lot of part where the, refu uh, the deportees come. Some of the refugees came here. The migrant caravan, when they did that rush, they bum-rushed the border, it was through here. The wall, the neighbors are friendly. They have a lot of barbed wire. And, uh, and then again here, the prostitution, trash, violence, and then H&M in America. So every day, this is what I see. Young Tony, he saw this stuff too, but he didn't let it bother him. These days, it bothers him a lot. We get off here. Gracias. Oye, no me cambio. Cambio. Okay. Sale. Sí, no, no, no the bus dropped us off just a few feet from where we needed to go to cross into the U.S. We are under a bridge that we just crossed in the bus. This is uh, the Ped West crossing, and uh, it's a pedestrian crossing. We're going to go to the United States like 100,000 people do every day from here, and we're going to become the workforce of uh, America's finest city. It's shocking here sometimes because there is 
everything to do with refugee crisis is here. So they give the appointments here to get asylum. Asylum appointments are given here. So there'll be a lot of people here. A lot of them are uh, Haitian or straight up African. And then not so many Central American lately. Now you'll see mostly black people. And occasional Central Americans and even Mexicans, of course, because people are escaping horrible shit in Mexico too, by the way. And this was all back before the entire asylum system essentially shut down during the pandemic. Now it's even worse. Tony's walk through death row, his bus ride over the poverty-filled river, his walk through the heart of the migrant crisis, it makes sense that he's feeling the way he feels, struggling to love Tijuana the way he used to when he was younger. Next, we hustle to get ourselves into the borderline before it got any longer. Now I'm border walking. Ain't no time. Ain't no time for a podcast, Kinsey. We need to beat the crowds. Look at that. They're coming. Right before we stepped into the line, though, we passed a newsstand. Tony stopped to buy a copy of the newspaper, Seta. And the headline that day was about 15 people killed in the city the night before. And I saw it. Disappointment and deep sadness wash across Tony's face. I could see exactly how defeated he was feeling. I don't think that violence in Tijuana gets enough press or sympathy from anyone because it's happening to groups of people that are marginalized and, and no one hears a damn thing about it ever. I think that for things to change, there has to be public outcry, and I don't see the public outcry. Why aren't people upset about this? Why aren't people upset about this? I don't know, man. Once we crossed through the port of entry into the U.S., we headed east toward the trolley stop nearby. The trolley pulled up and we joined dozens of other people just like Tony. People who had just crossed through the border by foot so they could take the trolley to work. And like Tony, a lot of people on the trolley have dual citizenship. Maybe they were born in the U.S., but their family lives in Mexico. Maybe they were born in Mexico and immigrated to the U.S. only to return to live in Mexico. That's what I did. Having that citizenship status in both countries, it's a huge privilege. And the economic benefits it provides are one of the main reasons Tony wasn't quite ready to break up with Tijuana. In San Diego, Tony says he doesn't make enough money to call himself middle class. In Tijuana, though, he's solidly upper middle class. I change a social status as soon as I cross the border. And that happens to almost everybody here. We're lucky to be able to make dollars and go back to Mexico, a poor place, and live large with that. And I feel that we're super lucky and privileged to be able to be part of both cultures and live both cities and experience both cities and learn from both cities. And that makes me a richer man than any payday. Because I thoroughly enjoy being a dual citizen and I thoroughly enjoy not just being binational but being by border man, being bicultural. Because I, I, I grew up in white schools, private white schools, but I also went to Mexican schools, and, and, and I know both cultures, you know? I'm both American, and I'm both Mexican-American, and I'm also Mexican-Mexican, you know what I mean? And I think that sets me aside a little bit from the average pocho. Pocho, by the way, is a term used to describe Mexicans who aren't Mexican enough. I remember going to visit family back in Mexico when I was a kid and having a pretty difficult time communicating full thoughts in full Spanish. I would throw in little bits of English here and there and people definitely made fun of you, called you gringo and made you feel like you were lesser than. Historically, the term has definitely been derogatory, but here in the border region, I think over the years, a lot of us have taken it as a point of 
pride to speak Spanglish and be a pocho and be able to move and dance between two languages. Like Tony, he's totally fine calling himself a pocho. And he's got lots of thoughts and opinions about how pochos like him and me make the Tijuana world go round. Basically, in Tijuana, a city where something, what, 80,000 people at least cross to work every day? I don't know. That's a lot of money coming back. That's a lot of dollars coming back. We've become pochos. I'm speaking for Mexican-Americans that live in Tijuana. It's because of pochos that the resurgence in uh, the gastro scene is happening. It's because of pochos that Valle de Guadalupe exists. It's pocho money. It's because of pochos that there's all these apartments in Tijuana going up and all these, uh, how do you say, uh, high-rise apartments. The skyline is changing because of pocho money. The bars, hey, the shady shit, the prostitution. That exists because of pochos too. And it's true. So it's both a curse and a blessing. We're getting off here. We got off the trolley and then got on a bus to downtown Chula Vista, a suburb of San Diego that's close to the border. It was a quick ride to Third Avenue, the city's main commercial street. Once we got there, we walked down an alley behind Third to where Tony's food truck was parked. Okay, so this food truck actually takes us back to that meetup between Tony and Anthony Bourdain back in 2012. Because after that happened, Tony capitalized on his 15 minutes of international fame. He scored a gig writing about food for Vice, then he eventually decided to open his own food truck in San Diego instead of in Tijuana since he can charge more and make more money in the US while also taking advantage of the cheaper lifestyle in Tijuana. He's very intelligently riding that Bourdain bump as long as he can. And it's totally working. I'm making more money than I ever did in this food truck. Shit, I paid for a $10,000 wedding in Vegas last week on $5 tacos, baby. So being on the site has helped my business a lot, a lot. So that's where we were headed on our big cross-border commute that day in 2019, to Tony's food truck, Corazón de Torta. At the end of the alley, we got to a VFW, a members-only bar for war vets. Tony sometimes keeps his food truck there, parked behind the bar. So here she is. She's beautiful. Does this change a lot of this menu? Yeah, it changes all the time. Right here it said, the meatball chipotle sub as seen on the cooking channels, the best thing I ever ate, which is where we were recently uh, featured on a show. Let's go inside. Don't step on that one, guys. Okay. Noted. The further this, one, the one step. outside, yeah. He's broke. Just like the owner, he's broke. <laughs> <laughs> but not broken. So on a normal day when a podcast crew isn't following his every move, Tony would go in and use the kitchen at the vet bar to prep some food for the day. This is my kitchen. We got a grill. We got a deep fryer. Then he'd drive to a brewery in San Diego or some other spot where he'd catch a crowd. One dirty taco, one al pastor taco. Everything on it? Onion, cilantro, guac? Yeah. Anything else? It's going to be $8. Are you going to be in the brewery? Yep. I'll deliver it to you, Maeve. He'd work in the food truck all day. Then after a long day's work, Tony would start on his reverse cross-border trek. He would get home pretty late most nights, then sleep, wake up, and do the whole thing over again. It's a tough life, but living in Tijuana and working in San Diego means Tony gets to live in that nice apartment on the hill. And back when we talked to him, it was a life he wasn't quite ready to give up. But then he did. Tony, he ultimately made up his mind about Tijuana. See, not long after we shadowed him that day in 2019, there was a carjacking in his neighborhood. It happened right down the street from where he was living. 
The woman in the car resisted and was shot to death. Right in front of her own children who were in the car. And that was it. That was the last straw. Tony has a family to raise. And this time, the violence had hit way too close to home. A few days later, Tony posted on Facebook and announced to the world that he was leaving Tijuana for good. I live in the suburbs of Chula Vista now. There's a park and there's a swimming pool. My daughter loves it, but it's quiet. <laughs> it's very quiet. I mean, I love TJ. It's a great place. It's very permissive. And I have fond memories of family and friends there. Right now, it's not the place that I should be because I have work and other situations in a family, but its uniqueness and its wackiness is something that I love so much. I, I did move because of my daughter. I didn't want her to grow up in Tijuana, to be quite honest. I didn't feel it was the kind of place to raise a family. That being said, I don't want her to be like, oblivious to what's going on in the world and I'm going to teach her things and I'm going to take her places when she gets older and in different situations with different people of different socioeconomic statuses just like a normal child should you know I want to take her that and show her that but it was just easier moving over here I mean Tijuana is a vibrant fun town we all know that it's a great place to have fun but Tijuana is going to keep being Tijuana forever I learned that reputations, you have to earn them. And uh, the city of Tijuana, for good or for bad, has a reputation. And I saw with my own eyes how that reputation was earned. I did miss Tijuana's accessibility as far as in affordability. But some things you pay the price, and time is money. So <sighs> I honestly, and I'm going to say this on the radio or wherever this comes up, I do not miss living in Tijuana. Not as a 40-year-old man with a daughter and a herniated disc. <laughs> Next time on Port of Entry. Some people think if you get married, you automatically get citizenship. I, I thought it was going to be a walk in the park, and <laughs> boy, was I surprised. <laughs> we talked to two families separated by deportation about how their love keeps them connected despite the border wall running through their lives. Port of Entry is written and produced by Kinsey Moreland. Emily Jankowski is the director of sound design. Curtis Fox and Elisa Barba edited this episode. And hey, if you're listening on NPR One right now, take a minute and click on the Port of Entry logo, then hit the plus button and tap follow this show. I'm Alan Lilienthal. Thank you for listening. Mm-hmm.